So I'm going to briefly run through a kind of high-level overview of Bitcoins this evening. So this is kind of the other side of uh, this anonymity concept we've been talking about from a slightly different angle. Uh, as a disclosure, I own Bitcoins and I benefit if you guys all go home tonight, decide Bitcoins are the greatest thing ever and buy a bunch. Uh, it makes me a richer person. So take that. I, I won't be dishonest to you, but I am inherently a biased party. So we'll start by watching the fun Bitcoin intro video because it does a good job of doing the overview. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country, your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Bitcoins are generated all over the internet by anybody running a free application called a Bitcoin miner. Mining requires a certain amount of work for each block of coins. This amount is automatically adjusted by the network such that Bitcoins are always created at a predictable and limited rate. Your Bitcoins are stored in your digital wallet, which might look familiar if you use online banking. When you transfer Bitcoins, an electronic signature is added. After a few minutes, the transaction is verified by a miner and permanently and anonymously stored in the network. The Bitcoin software is completely open source and anybody can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Let's look at some examples of how Bitcoins are already used today. You can purchase video games, gifts, books, servers, and alpaca socks. Several currency exchanges exist where you can trade your Bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. Bitcoins are a great way for small businesses and freelancers to get noticed. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them. There are no chargebacks or fees, and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. For your first Bitcoins and more information, visit weusecoins.com. So, it's obviously a bit of bias on the part of people generating that video, but um, the basics are all correct, and we will get into some of the details. So, Bitcoins are a cryptocurrency. They sound really good, but how do they actually work? So what is a digital cryptocurrency is maybe the place to start with this. Um, the idea behind a regular currency, right? I don't think I have any cash in my wallet. This would be a way better moment to pull out my wallet if I did. Uh, the way a regular currency works though, right, is like you have a dollar, and that dollar, the object, the physical object itself, represents the value that the dollar represents. By giving that dollar to somebody else, they then have the value that that dollar represents, right? At a time, your dollar corresponded to a certain amount of gold sitting in Fort Knox, that hasn't been true for the last 50 years, but there is an associated value with the dollar, and you can exchange it by giving someone the physical entity of the actual money. Uh, digital currency works a little bit differently. Digital currency, you can't give someone the physical entity, right? Because there is no physical entity. It's a series of bits. You can make copies of it. Uh, it's not like a one thing that exists that you could just transfer to someone by handing it to them. So instead, we kind of have the concept of a deed that works a lot like a car deed does. I don't know if people have ever bought or sold cars here before, but the concept is similar. So with a digital coin, you can have multiple copies of it, but associated with each coin is essentially a deed that says who the current owner of the coin is and as well as all previous owners of the coin. So, assuming you can guarantee this accuracy, it doesn't matter how many copies of this coin there are, that's telling you the one person whose value associated with this coin actually belongs to. So, the way you accomplish this is, like Matt was saying, you use public and private key cryptography. Again, I'm not gonna dive way into it, but the basic gist is, if you wanna transfer a coin from one person to another, you can do so by essentially signing, you having the, it's a chain of events, so the previous owner can use their private key to sign the next owner's uh, identification and then transfer it to them. And the only person who can perform this action is the current owner. So the private key infrastructure and public private key cryptography is kind of what's happening behind the scenes here to make this signature secure, such that the only person that can actually transfer a coin is the current owner. 
So this works just great if everyone's honest and the original owner decides he wants to transfer it to person B, he sets up, signs the, basically signs the coin over to the new person, and then it's theirs to spend. If we take, there's a PayPal reference at the end that uh, is kind of the original descriptor of how Bitcoin works. This is their image. So it's essentially showing the same thing as before, but with a few more of the details. But the concept is the same. Every previous owner to transfer the key essentially involves signing a new copy of the key over to the next owner. This does have an inherent problem in it, though. While it guarantees that the owner of the coin is the only person who can transfer or spend it, it doesn't do anything to make sure that the original owner only ever spends the coin once, right? In this system, there's nothing to prevent this person from being dishonest and essentially making two copies of his key, signing one over two different people, and having them both think that they've been paid with this amount of money, right? That they are the new owner of this key. Now, really, there are two keys in the network and there are discrepancies in <coughs> who's the corrupt owner. Um, there's really no way to resolve this discrepancy in this. They're both technically the correct owner by the rules of the network, but obviously this coin's no longer worth anything because we've just magically doubled it. So how can we prevent this double spending problem? And the basic gist of it is any solution to prevent this problem needs to be aware of all transactions in the network because once you know every transaction that's ever happened, you can always just make a rule that the earliest transaction is the valid one. So in this previous case, Nothing ever happens simultaneously in the real world, right? And there's logical clocks for distributed systems things to ensure that that's true. If we have a global view of every transaction that's ever happened, then we can simply invalidate whichever one of these happens second. So at that point, we can say this one's invalid. We can inform this person that when it's happening, so he knows not to accept this as payment. And we can now guarantee that you can only ever spend a coin a single time. Accomplishing this, so how one's aware of all these transactions is what becomes kind of the complicated issue behind the scenes here. The traditional solution to this problem is to have a centralized entity. So we'll call it the mint in this situation, where every time you want to spend a Bitcoin, right, every time you want to spend a currency, you have to send that through the central entity. Then it becomes pretty trivial for the central entity to track every transaction that's ever happened, to order the transactions, <coughs> and to basically only issue. So what the mint actually does is the mint shreds up the old coin and if the transaction is valid, generates a new coin and actually sends that to the person. And then you only ever accept coins from the mint. You never actually accept coins directly from anyone else. So this solves the problem, but it relies on this centralized entity, which has a number of problems. It's a single point of failure. It's a single person who you have to be comfortable with knowing about every transaction on the planet, right? I mean, there's a privacy issue here. Um, and there's just a, there's a load issue here, right? Can this scale? Can you ever possibly have one person or one entity that's in charge of maintaining, if this ever became like the only global currency, does, could, could that even scale? So we want a solution that doesn't involve a central entity. And that's where Bitcoins come in. So there are distributed solutions to this problem, and what they basically involve is building a distributed timestamp server. So the crux here is if we can have some way to distribute the list of transactions and some way to, as a distributed group, decide which one happened first, then we can guarantee that everything can only get spent once, and we can avoid the need for a centralized entity. So the way this actually starts to work is we can push this all out into the network. We can basically have volunteers in the network where every time we spend a Bitcoin, we essentially have them sign off on the transaction and timestamp it when they do, such that we can then later on, when that coin comes up again, they can search the network for the previous uh, action with that coin, check the timestamp, make sure that the oldest timestamp uh, is the one that corresponds to the person who's trying to spend it to you, so you can verify that they're the ones that actually own it. Um, and that way you can kind of a distributed base guarantee that uh, the coin can only be spent once. So the downside to obviously doing this is we still have a problem. We can push this timestamping out into a network, but what if multiple hosts of the network disagree, right? What if I spend my Bitcoin and Tom sitting in the network somewhere signs off on one time and Joe sitting in the network elsewhere signs off on a different time? What if I spend it twice, right? What if I change my network connection? What if I spend it once when I'm sitting in China and someone in China sees the transaction and signs off on it, and then because of the Great Firewall or something, I take it back to the United States, I spend it again, 
that person never having communicated with the person in China, someone else signs off on it here, and have we really solved the problem, right? If this person here doesn't know that first transaction happened, then we have, we can essentially exploit the distributed nature and we're back to the problem we originally had, which is how do we know which timestamp's correct? So the way we get around that involves a couple of steps. The first step is making it computationally difficult to timestamp these keys. So, and you'll see why this is necessary later. So we have what's called a proof of work, where a proof of work is basically, we'll go into the details one they use here, but a proof of work is basically something we add that is hard for a computer to do. Like your computer has to spend some time getting it done. Um, so what Bitcoin actually uses is a pre-existing proof of work concept called HashCash that was originally designed as a DDoS defense and has actually subsequently been used as a spam defense. What it basically does is it says uh, the job of your computer is such, right? So your computer gets some piece of data. And before it can pre present that data, <coughs> it's going to present that data to someone, but that person's only going to accept the data if it satisfies some property being the specific property here. So before you can present this data to the, to the user or to some additional service, you have to add a nonce, so this is essentially just some randomly chosen addition. So you're taking the data and you're going to append some randomly chosen number, this may be an easy way to think about it to the end. But that number you have to choose in a very specific way. Namely, you're going to choose a number such that when you append the data and that number and you send it to a hash algorithm like SHA, so hash algorithms map you know, large data sets down to specific points in space. So you send it to some hash algorithm such that the hashed value ends in a specific number of zeros, right? This is kind of an arbitrary condition. You could say the hash value has to end in a specific number of ones, right? You could say it has to end in 135742. You can say anything. The point is, you're basically telling them what their hash has to be. So the trick to this is, hashes are irreversible. I can't know that I need a hash that ends in zeros and then just immediately know what nonce I need to append to get that. The only way to find one of these hashes that ends in, you know, a specified number of zeros, obviously, the larger n is, the more work this is, the harder this is, the harder problem this is to solve. But if n is sufficiently big, the only way for me to figure out whether or not I've picked a number that ends in all zeros is to iteratively try this via brute force. So I pick some random number, I compute the hash, I see if it satisfies this condition. If it doesn't, I increment my random number by one, I repeat the process, so on and so forth. This is very computationally intensive, right? This is brute force password breaking, essentially, but we're forcing you to do it because when you send me your data in nonce, I'm immediately going to rerun this hash. So it's easy for me to verify, right? When you send me your data, I can take it, run the hash, and I can immediately see in a split second whether or not it ends in all zeros. If it does, then I accept it. I know that you have done some minimal amount of work. You have proved to me that you've done a certain amount of CPU cycles. Um, and then I will accept it. If it doesn't end in all zeros, I consider your proof invalid and I can just not accept your data, right? So this essentially gives me a scheme to force any one of you to do something on your computer, expend a certain amount of computational resource, and prove to me that you've done that in a cryptographically secure manner. People are clear on this because everything else kind of rides on it. So are the SHA-1 hashes sufficiently big that you can't just do a forward search attack and find a bunch of things that end in n zero bits and then... So you probably wouldn't use SHA-1. I mean, I just, you would use, I don't know exactly what the crypto might use, like, uh, I don't know exactly what it uses. It uses one of the SHA algorithms. But yeah, you would pick, obviously, there are two metrics you can change here to increase the amount of work required. One is what hashing algorithm you're using, and the other one is how big it's in. Um, so you would use a, I mean, you would pick, you need to pick a hashing algorithm that hasn't been broken, and you would pick a value that's sufficiently large that like a rainbow tables attack or something wouldn't be effective. Um, and there's other things you can do. I mean, you can add in salts and, and other kind of stuff to break rainbow table attacks. But there are ways to do it fairly securely, such that it is, I mean, you can always get lucky. You're picking a random number, right? Your first hash could be that. But probabilistically, you're going to have to expend a specific amount of time for a specific value of n in order to solve this problem. It's a uh, SHA-256, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So SHA-256 is what you, is what they use today. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, two to the 256 is more than there are estimated atoms in the universe. <laughs> so SHA-512 is... So the other side of this, you saw in that video at the beginning, they made that note about 
they basically uh, they guarantee that the that the rate you can mine bitcoins is predictable. The way they do that is by dynamically changing this again. So as more people in the world are mining bitcoins, right? Uh, they basically increase this in. So the more people are searching for bitcoins, the harder they make them to find. Um, and that way, they can vary by by regulating this value of in the Bitcoin network can very carefully control exactly how many Bitcoins can ever be generated, which we're not going to get into tonight. You could do an entire economics lecture on Bitcoins, but there is economically advantageous reasons for being able to control, this is essentially controlling the rate of inflation. So by staggering in, this is your fun computer science economics here, you can change in to control the rate of inflation in a Bitcoin economy. Is that how you're saying that's how Bitcoins are created? Uh, kind of. We're not entirely there yet. So does someone with a really fast computer, can they just mine them really, like, faster than some guy with a... With yes, the faster your computer, the faster you can mine them. Huh. Yeah, but it's not, it, that's a good thing. Uh, it's essentially forcing you to, I, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, it's not, this is not directly translate to how Bitcoins are mined. It's a little bit, what mining is, is a little bit more complicated. We'll get there momentarily, but... This is the underlying, this is the regulator for how quickly Bitcoins can be mined. Um, so now what we can do is we distribute the same thing again, but we're adding one thing to it. So we have our distributed timestamp server, but now in addition to various nodes on the network basically signing off and timestamping these transactions, every node on the network basically has to add this proof of work to it. So now when you're sitting on the network, you can't just timestamp something, you have to invest some energy and then timestamp something. And this is important for a reason. Namely, it helps us to solve this problem of who do we trust. So by making it computationally difficult to sign something on the network, what we've essentially done is we've added a computational weight to all the information we're receiving on the network. Such that if you want to generate a bunch of fake information on the network, right? Like if you want to generate a bunch of fake timestamps to try to make it look like someone spent a Bitcoin they haven't or something, you can do it but it's going to require extra work on your part. You're going to have to invest extra work in order to do that. And at the same time, other people on the network are going to be investing work as well, but they're not going to be dishonest. So what this essentially does is we've now made it, you have to invest work in order to manipulate the network. We haven't stopped you from manipulating the network, but we've assigned a cost you have to insert in order to manipulate the network. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add one more rule and we're going to say, well, our network may have multiple views. We may have multiple timestamps that different people agree on, but we're essentially going to trust the majority. So the timestamp that the most people in the network think is the valid one, we're going to trust. Uh, this is kind of similar to the way Tor works with directory servers, where it simply is there's a majority vote as to who's legitimate on the network, and that's the one you trust. Um, so we do what we call is we trust the longest chain. Um, so essentially every transaction has one of these timestamps with it, and there's a following transaction with a timestamp, and these build up a chain. And every timestamp, basically, you can have multiple, it's starting to build a tree because every, this tree splits every time someone disagrees. But this tree is going to have some longest path, and the longest path is going to correspond to what the majority of the network agrees with. This, combined with the fact <coughs> that we require this proof of work, uh, essentially creates a situation where you can game the network, but you have to have more than half the computational power on the network under your control in order to do so. Because while you're trying to fake the network and split off this chain, everyone else on the network is likely not working with you and they're actually pooling their resources to build the legitimate chain faster than you're capable of building the illegitimate chain. So your ability to build these illegitimate chains, or so whoever has the most computational power, I think that's my next set of slides here, right? So the, the security model here is whoever on the network has the most computational power collectively wins. So yes, you can break the Bitcoin network, but in order to do so, you have to have you, you have to come up with an entity that has more computational power than everybody else, and that turns out to be very hard to do. Uh, it kind of comes into game theory problems here, but as an individual on the Bitcoin network, not trying to attack. So in order, the only way you're ever going to benefit from attacking the network is if you can actually have more than half the computational power. That's extremely hard. But you can benefit a little bit by just having a small bit of computational power and working honestly with everyone else. So there's an incentive for you to use your computational power for honest means, because it's going to be way more likely that that will actually reap benefits for you than there is to you know, go broke and actually try to pool up enough power to overcome everybody else who's all working together legitimately. So does this security model kind of make sense? 
Um, so the underlying all of this is, well, so why do you want to donate your computer's time to essentially time stamping and doing these proof of works, right? The network relies on a bunch of honest people doing that. It relies on a bunch of people donating their computer time to being part of the legitimate Bitcoin network, uh, building the main chain, generating timestamps, generating proofs of work. Um, what's the incentive for you, right? That's gonna cost you money because it's gonna cost you electricity, it's gonna cost you the power of your computer, it's gonna cost you the money to build a fast computer if you wanna to dedicate to doing this. There is an expense to you to be involved in the Bitcoin network. So why would you ever wanna be a timestamping node? And the answer is, today we give you a reward. Uh, this is what we call Bitcoin mining. So today, if you're willing to dedicate your machine to being part of the network, to doing these timestamps, and to helping basically join the large computational power base that's ensuring that the legitimate chain will always grow faster than any illegitimate one, we basically are saying, we're gonna randomly like hand out new Bitcoins into the network at a predetermined rate, and we're gonna give them to you with a probability equal to the amount of computing power you're donating to the network. So we're essentially paying you probabilistically for your time, such that the more time you, uh, you spend legitimately helping further the Bitcoin network, the more likely you are to get free Bitcoins. And Bitcoins have real value, as we see today, uh, as we'll see here in a minute. That's today. There's a long-term scheme here. So today, this is what we call Bitcoin mining. You can do it on your computer at home. You're basically donating your computer to basically help do those proof of works, to help further the legitimate chain, and in return, we are steadily releasing Bitcoins, and we, meaning the core network software, is steadily releasing new Bitcoins into the network, and you might get lucky and have one released to you. It's more likely the more time you donate to the network. That's obviously uh, a model that you know relies on infinite inflation, because we're magically generating, and this is when the US Mint prints new money, right? We're magically generating new Bitcoins and introducing them into the network. That's inherently a form of inflation. Uh, so there's a plan, though. The Bitcoin software is designed such that the number of Bitcoins will eventually level out at about 21 million Bitcoins in existence. There's, I'm not going into the details, but there's more cryptographic magic kind of backing some of this up, um, such that you can't just go home and like invent a new Bitcoin. Inventing a new Bitcoin relies on some stuff that only the network kind of internally can do. Um, but we're regulating this. This is where we're changing the value of in such that so this is the rate at which we're generating Bitcoins, more or less. So the total number of Bitcoins, we're currently at 2013. So we're sitting at about halfway, right? We've generated about half of all the Bitcoins that are ever going to exist. Um, as we get closer to this, there's going to be fewer and fewer coins generated. So as we get closer to that limit, there becomes a lower and lower chance that you're going to actually be able to earn any Bitcoins mining, right? It's an asymptotic limit, so you, it'll never completely go away but it becomes a vanishingly small. Mining will stop working by the year 2033, right? It'll be impossible to mine new Bitcoins, or it'll be incredibly unlikely that you will, you know, it's gonna turn into one new Bitcoin every several years, followed by one new Bitcoin every 10 years, followed by one new Bitcoin every 100 years, right? You're not, it's, it's vanishingly uh, small chance of ever getting a new Bitcoin. So, we need a longer term model. And that is, well, this is a bootstrapping technique, is all that Bitcoin mining really is. They figured, well, hey, what am I doing? I'm inventing a new currency. I'm not going to convince everyone in the world to buy into my new currency right away. I need some incentive to get them to use it. That's why Bitcoin mining exists. They're saying, today, you, can, you have an incentive to use Bitcoins. You can just donate your computing power and earn money. But by the time the Bitcoins are so well established that there are that many of them in circulation and we're 30 years after this currency has been introduced, they're assuming at this point the currency has been established enough that we don't need to give you free Bitcoins anymore. Instead, other people in the world are, will start paying you directly to essentially verify their Bitcoin transactions for them. So now every time you spend Bitcoin, some fraction of that's gonna basically go toward the people who are using their computing resources to guarantee that your Bitcoin transaction is legitimate. Um, so this is actually a really clever model. Again, it has a lot more to do with economics than technology, but Bitcoin mining won't work forever. It worked a lot better a few years ago than it does today, right? This is exponential decrease. Um, but we are getting to the point where even today you do get charged transactions for certain fees. And as we go through in time, the transactions you get charged will increase, that's how people will get paid. The Bitcoins you can mine will decrease, that starts to go away as the incentivized factor. So where does the privacy and anonymity come into all of this? Um, 
it's not so much that Bitcoins are inherently anonymous as they change the privacy model versus the standard financial system. So in our standard financial system, we have a privacy wall, but it exists here, right? When you open a bank account, when you use your credit card, your identities, the transactions associated with it, are known to a trusted third party, right? You can't open a bank account without showing them a valid ID, right? Your bank knows your name. Uh, you can't get a credit card, you can't get a loan, you can't do anything without proving your identity. You're basically designating your bank, being that trusted third party, as someone who you're trusting to keep your transactions <coughs> private, and then it's your bank's job to make sure that you know your credit card history doesn't get revealed to the general public. The Bitcoin changes that. With Bitcoins, <coughs> transactions are all public. By definition, they have to be. The network only works, again, if everyone agrees on what transactions have happened and the timestamp associated with them. So in Bitcoins, your transactions are less private than they are today, right? Anyone in the world can see, at what, can see the complete history of every Bitcoin everywhere. But in the Bitcoin network, the privacy wall exists here. To open a Bitcoin account, you don't need to give anyone your name. You load a piece of software, it generates a random key, and people can send you money by basically sending, I mean, you saw that a minute ago, but you can send me money by, I could have put it up here. Uh, I have like several Bitcoin wallets, each of which has essentially an address, it's a form of public key associated with it, that's like 30 random characters long. So just by knowing those 30 random characters, you can send me money, you never even have to know my name, right? I can get online and say, I am offering some service, send your money to this random address, I will get your money, but there's a strong privacy wall here. No one ever knows who that money's actually going to, right? There is no chain. There's no government that can block out this account. There is no ability for the IRS to audit this account, so on and so forth. The privacy screen's in a different place. Uh, this doesn't, it's not 100%, I mean, this doesn't stop you from being stupid, right? There's, sometimes people use Bitcoin in, uh, with Tor uh, as a combination, because obviously, if, I'm posting a website at my house and I have my Bitcoin address on it, right? The Bitcoin address itself may be anonymous, but if you're pulling it down off a website that you can call up Comcast and realize that I'm paying Comcast to host that website, all of a sudden you have a pretty good idea who that Bitcoin address is actually affiliated with, right? So this isn't bulletproof by itself, but when used properly, this basically allows people to send money to you without actually knowing your real identity, which is very difficult to do in the traditional banking system. Questions on this? So just a few metrics. Um, this is a map of Bitcoin values thus far. So this is Bitcoins versus the US dollar. It is a real currency. It's widely deployed, uh, or at least it is today. There have been some rather epic crashes. So I mean, this is a highly speculative currency, right? Don't buy Bitcoins unless you have a stomach for maybe losing all your money tomorrow, because this is largely an artificial economy. There is no gold backing up my Bitcoins, right? There is no standard. My Bitcoin's value is whatever someone's willing to pay me for it. And tomorrow, everyone in the world will decide Bitcoins are farce, they're stupid, and they're worthless, and all of my Bitcoins would be worthless. But thus far, Bitcoins, other than the early crash here, which happened a little over a year ago now, uh, Bitcoins have actually been growing fairly steadily since then, and there's a lot of websites that affect them. What, what this curve could be taken to represent to some extent is, People associate an intrinsic value with being able to have essentially an anonymous, non-regulated currency. Uh, and that's why they're willing to pay $25 to buy one of your Bitcoins right now. You can also mine these Bitcoins, but the point of profitability in mining Bitcoins has disappeared pretty, I mean, you can't really make any money mining, mining Bitcoins today unless you have to know a supercomputer. But your regular computer sitting at home is not gonna be able to mine fast enough because again, remember they're regulating that rate. So you're not gonna be able to mine fast enough to essentially generate Bitcoins for free. It'll cost you more money in electricity than it will you'll actually ever earn via your Bitcoins. But you can still get Bitcoins, you just have to pay someone who already has them to give them to you, right? There's a scarcity here and a willingness to pay for it. Um, there's a number of references if you're interested in this where you can go into more details. Like I said, this was kind of the high level overview. Uh, the one other thing I will add is Bitcoins plus Tor are a common combination. The maybe uh, most controversial slash least glorious implementation of this is the website or web service called Silk Road. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with it. What Silk Road is, Silk Road takes advantage of those Tor uh, destination points that Matt was talking about to essentially 
host anonymous web servers. So Silk Road is a web service, but nobody knows where those servers are, and they use Tor to achieve that. You can go on Silk Road and buy pretty much any drug you've ever heard of to get shipped to your house, but you're only allowed to pay in Bitcoins. So Silk Road is leveraging these two anonymized technologies to essentially allow you to have a illegal marketplace online. Um, I'll send it out to the group later. There's a, actually a good expose on someone's first person experience using Silk Road. Again, I don't contone anyone going and buying illegal things, and just because you make it easier to get away with it doesn't mean that you won't get caught and go to jail for it, but um, yeah, it leverages Bitcoins and Tor to operate what appears to be a rather effective you know, eBay for drugs, uh, more or less, and other things, but mainly drugs. I guess we should be thankful it's mainly drugs and not other things. Well, can um, I guess Bitcoins plus Tor also be used for like, it sounds like it'd be a great tool to use for money laundering. And the US government would yeah. probably agree to you. Uh, I don't have any statistics on this, but you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that gets you in trouble on YouTube. If I were running a worldwide terrorist organization with the intent to bring down large first world countries via asymmetric warfare techniques, mm -hmm. I would be using Bitcoin uh, and Tor to move money around to various operatives and buy C4, right? Um, yeah, there's a darker side to these things. But at the same time, you can use Bitcoins because you're sitting inside a government with an oppressive regime to buy server time in the United States so you can host your pro-democracy server, right, running via Tor such that your government can't shut it down. I mean, yeah, the tools themselves are not inherently good or bad. Do they enable people to do bad things that our traditional law enforcement system doesn't really have a good way of catching? Absolutely. Uh, but the counter argument to this is, I mean, realize both Tor and Bitcoins come out of a, uh, a pretty, what would the word be? Uh, anarchistic, being on the anarchy side of kind of the hacker movement, such that we don't want a government to regulate our things, we don't want a government to watch our traffic. We want to be able to do it on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, and that's where big points into work. So there's good and bad. Right now, the media focuses on that. But you know, you can buy a lot of server hosters will let you spend bitcoins. I own bitcoins. It's not to buy drugs. It's because I'm being really speculative and hoping this curve keeps going up such that I can eventually sell my bitcoins for more than I bought them for and make money off them, right? So uh, it's also so if I ever wanted to buy something and just feel cool about no one being able to trace it, I can. It would be something totally legitimate. I just feel good about the fact that I didn't rely on Wall Street to make sure that my, uh, <laughs> my funds got from point A to point B. There are other ways, and that's what Bitcoin's presented. Well, plus, with anyone moving a significant amount of money that you would want to be laundering in the first place, that would like significantly affect the price of Bitcoin as well. Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, maybe. I mean, if you bought them all at once, right? But there's a lot of it. There's enough legit. There's a lot of Bitcoin traffic. I, I could pull down the exact number, but I think it's to the tune of like hundreds of millions of dollars traded in Bitcoins a day. So we've gotten past the point where your one giant Bitcoin merge is going to make that noticeable blip. It's obviously, so the place you can catch this is, how do you buy those Bitcoins in the first place, right? So the biggest Bitcoin exchange uh, is probably Mt. Gox. We can look at it real quick. Um, so this is a service that uh, is hosted in Japan, and it's a Bitcoin exchange. They will trade various currencies, including the US dollar, for Bitcoins, right? So the Bitcoin itself may be anonymous, but Mt. Gox has its own rules, right? In order for you to pay Mt. Gox for your Bitcoins, there's gonna be a funding trail there somewhere. So the funding trail might end the moment you buy Bitcoins, but you can always trace it up against that point. So Bitcoins add plausible deniability, right? I can be a giant organization, you can know I bought a bunch of Bitcoins, but you'll never know what I spent them on. But yeah, I mean, if you're the Department of Homeland Security, you're probably looking for red flags of identified extremists happening to send large amounts of money around Gox. I mean, maybe you're never gonna prove what they actually ended up using those funds for after they bought Bitcoins, but it could be a red flag in the first place that you should maybe look closer at what's going on there. Is not Gox under US jurisdiction? Because I don't see Japanese. Oh, okay. Uh, the jurisdictional issues with this are a gray area. It's not illegal. I, well, I'm not a lawyer. I don't think it's illegal to use Bitcoins. Um, it's not well regulated. Mainly it's a tax issue. So if you sell goods in Bitcoins, right, I would technically still have taxes on there, on those. But the IRS doesn't provide a form for like entering in how many Bitcoins worth of profit I made to calculate my tax on it. Um, 
you would talk to an accountant if you, I mean, and, and the big companies, so like the EEF, I think, among various others, uh, so Mega, you know, Kim.com's new venture will accept Bitcoins as payment. So there are le legitimate companies using these for payment. There are governments around the world who are, so the Bitcoin Foundation is based in the United States. They're a nonprofit. They pay their employees strictly in Bitcoins. They pay income tax on those Bitcoins. They just have an accountant who sits there and basically, I mean, it's kind of a gray area. They have a way they do it. The IRS hasn't told them it's wrong yet. They basically convert the value of the Bitcoins to the equivalent value in US dollars and pay taxes on that. It, it inherently defies existing regulations. That doesn't mean it's illegal. Uh, but yeah, there's some interesting issues that have yet to be worked out. Um, it is growing pretty rapidly. So the issues that have yet to be worked out, I mean, it's going to be very difficult for a government to just say, we're going to ban Bitcoins at this point, because like, what are you going to do, right? It's distributed peer to peer. Can you ever really stop it? So the question I think is going to be is, how do you make it so people can pay taxes on their Bitcoins, so on and so forth. So um, when you said that later there's going to be transaction fees, or there are right now, who do those go to? Wait. So uh, I'm less versed in the exact details, but they essentially go so they would go to, I mean, there would need to be a broker in between, but they eventually go to the people who are actually putting in the computational time. So the way it may, and today it's a bunch of volunteers, and that you know gets a little bit more of an issue, but eventually maybe you join Mount Gox, right? You volunteer your time to Mount Gox. In return, Mount Gox pays you a little bit of money. Every time Mount Gox does a transaction, they take a percentage, generate those funds, and then pass them out to all of the people that are basically mining on Mount Gox's behalf. Uh, or, I mean, there would need, again, you need a broker. Um, and that's less well defined at this point, but you'd work something like that. Um, you can pay a transaction fee, like like you can volunteer to pay a fee to get your transaction process faster. So there are already some existing networks that handle this. I'm not totally familiar with them, but yeah, you never mine alone because it ceased to be profitable long ago. When you mine, you join like a mining collective, and some of these collectives probably have ways to like funnel fees to the appropriate people if you're spending a lot of time to them. Again. Bitcoin mining is fun, and you should do it because it's a good learning experience, but you're not going to make a lot of money off mining Bitcoins at this point. Uh, you might be able to make some money off buying a bunch of Bitcoins, holding on to them and hope they go up in value, but you also might lose all of your money doing that. So. Um, suppose that I have a, a, a powerful, malicious entity that doesn't like uh, say, you know, Bitcoins. Maybe I have a government or, I don't know, a bank. And I decide to suppose some, you know, start hoarding a lot of coins. Um, what would, would that, would that, that uh, say to buy half of the, the coins and hoarding them, um, kind of like show the Bitcoin idea because uh, people won't be as willing to adopt, you know, mining techniques or, you know, very mining things? I mean, I don't know if it would kill it, right? It would cost you an exorbitant sum of money to buy those, and a lot of people you didn't like would make money off you buying them because you'd have to buy them from people you don't like, right? So I don't know if you'd want to do that. I mean, there's an argument that a government would never want to do that in the first place, right? That's essentially like, yes, I will pay all of these people I disagree with huge sums of money such that I can control their resource. I mean, people are like, okay. <laughs> um, and what do you have at that point? Yeah, you have half the world's bitcoins. You can sit on them. More power to you. The rest of the world's going to keep trading their Bitcoins. I mean, yeah, you could probably manipulate it to some extent, like you could maybe like, like, I mean, like the U.S. government can manipulate the U.S. currency by controlling how quickly we release new money and interest rates. And yeah, but a buying half of the Bitcoins, especially, I mean, that's hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Bitcoins at this point, uh, would be cost prohibitive. And even if you did, it's kind of like, okay. So what, I mean, are you really willing to tie up that much money just to sit on it? The other side of it too is, you've now invested hundreds of billions of dollars into Bitcoins. If your goal is to kill the Bitcoin network, making your investment worthless, I mean, this really becomes an issue of how much money are you willing to throw away to bring down the Bitcoin network? And it becomes a pretty impalatable argument pretty quickly. The idea is the amount of money it would take to bring down the Bitcoin network is far more money than anyone would ever be willing Seems pretty much equivalent to just getting a bunch of money and holding onto it in like a normal economy. I don't see a big difference there. Yeah, right. But it's worse than that if your goal is to shut down Bitcoin. Because then it's like getting a bunch of money and lighting it on fire. Plus, then the value of the Bitcoin would appreciate, and everyone who didn't sell you would have even more money. Right. And there, I mean, there is a, and really, even if you did buy half the Bitcoins and destroy them, 
you would really just help everyone. I mean, you would increase the value of everyone else's Bitcoins, right? You would increase an additional scarcity. So the clever thing about the way Bitcoin is designed is it takes a lot of attacks and turns them into, if you want to attack the network in that way, you can, but you're actually going to strengthen the network in doing it, or it's going to cost you a huge amount of money at the very least. Those are decimal values in Bitcoins. Like, yes. How does that work? So you absolutely can buy less than one Bitcoin. Each Bitcoin is subdividable up to like, I don't know off the top of their head, seven, maybe eight decimal places or something. Um, there, there, so yeah, you can buy fractions of Bitcoins up to like the eighth decimal point. <laughs> there's, I didn't go into it, but actually all of that system of how you verify things actually works on like those subfractions, so on and so forth. If you want to know all of the dirty details, you can read the original paper. Um, so if you go to Bitcoin.org, here's kind of the original academic paper. It was published by this Satoshi Nakamoto, who's not a real person. Um, so no one actually knows who invented Bitcoin. It's thus far remained anonymous. There's some speculation that it might be these group of engineers who have published a patent that's somewhat similar to this. You can look up the details on Wikipedia. But the Bitcoin network exists as open source software. It's maintained by a set of volunteers. We know who a lot of them are. But the original Bitcoin idea, we don't really know who it came from. So, you know, another step of anonymity and a little bit of hacker fuck the man ethos in there. All right. So yeah, if you guys, this is a blockchain design. There's a number of websites. I'll send out these slides later here at the end. Blockchain is one of them. This is basically just a website where you can watch Bitcoin transactions go by. There's other websites where you can. So uh, Coinbase is basically an online Bitcoin wallet. You can also host your wallet locally. Obviously, if you use a web service, life is easier, but you're sacrificing some anonymity because you have to register for this web service and they require email addresses, so on and so forth. So you can host a wallet on your own machine. If your machine crashes and your hard disk gets erased, you're going to lose all the money in that wallet. So, I mean, there's trade offs. But look into Bitcoin, it's an interesting topic. You can get ripped always... off by online wallet people, too. Yeah, you need to be careful. Um, I think Coinbase is pretty legitimate, but obviously, don't go giving your money to a fly by night. I mean, yeah. No, big, big wallet ones have, have even been like hacked, quote unquote. Right, right. Like popular ones that lots of people used, and a lot of people lost money. It's unclear whether there was a real hack or if the owner just skipped out. Unlike a US bank account, there's no one insuring this, right? So like if your US bank somehow goes broke, the FDIC will pay you two hundred thousand dollars for each account that you have up to that to refund you any money you have with that bank. If these guys go broke and disappear tomorrow, I'm screwed. There's no insurance. Um, so it has risks, but it's an interesting concept. I think it may go somewhere. Well, you can also keep it on your hard drive, too. Yeah, well, I mean, that has risks as well, right? Now I can break into your house, steal your hard drive, and I have all of your Bitcoins. <laughs> uh, all right, that's all I got. We've already gone over. Uh, Matt, can, you, can I send out the PDF of your slides? Okay. I'll send out these slides afterwards. Uh, we'll meet again in two weeks. Thank you very much.